you will hear your time. Praise the Lord. We really thank the Lord for bringing us together, and I pray that the Bible study will enrich every life in Jesus' name. Now you do so very well today. I'm going to wait and see what will happen next Monday. Next Monday will be greater. Give me a good day. Amen. Now I leave my show people, soldiers of Christ, who want to stand up like soldiers, like an army. We're going to pray. Father, we thank you at this time and bless your name. We thank you, Lord, because of the Bible study. And we glorify your name because of those who are gathered here and those who are gathered all over the city of Lagos, all over the state of Lagos, all over Nigeria and all over the, all the countries in Africa and beyond. Tonight we come to learn. And we pray, Lord, teach us your mind and teach us your way in Jesus' name. And we ask you, oh Lord, that your word will teach us practical wisdom, practical instruction, practical admonition, practical encouragement, that we will know how we ought to live our lives your glory in Jesus' name. Bless us in the study of your word. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said. We are coming to Matthew chapter 7. And we are looking at verse 12. Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. That's the one verse we're looking at tonight. This verse has been called the golden rule. We call it the universal principle of a righteous life. The universal principle of the righteous life. Such, such a word like this. Number one, it concerns our lives. The way we live. It's not just the doctrine you believe, but the character, the conduct, the lifestyle. The way you live life. And it talks about a righteous life. It's not just an ordinary life. It's not a religious life. There are many people that are into religion. They're just into religion. They do not have salvation. They're not born again. They do not have the righteous life of Christ transpired into their lives. And said, so we're looking at this, not on the basis of just religion. There are many people that say, I'm into religion. And I try to do to other people as they do unto me. By the way, no religious man without salvation, without being born again, can do this. Every time, in every case, in every situation, in every circumstance, in every possibility of life, in the family. In the place of work, in the community, in society, in the private, in the public. No unbeliever can do this. You have to be born again. Give your life to the Lord, a real child of God. It is that experience of the new birth that makes the grace of God to come into us. And then we're able to live this righteous life, unselfish life. A life that considers other people. I mean, it says it's a principle, a principle. You see, a principle is different from a practice. If it's a practice, you can just apply it to this and that. But if it's, if it's a principle, it means that in every area of your life, you can bring out this word and say, this principle, how do I apply it to this relationship? A friend to a friend, a neighbor to a neighbor. A person to an enemy, a believer to a persecutor, a father to a child, 
a daughter to a mother, a teacher to a learner, an employer to an employee. The government to their subjects, everyone, in every relationship, in the church, in the society, in the office, a principle. And then it says, it's a universal principle. Universal. That means it cuts across every tribe, every province, every nation, every continent, the whole world. Universal. That means it cuts across every year, every decade, every century, every generation. A, a universal principle. That means it cuts across every section, every age, every era, every period of time. That's what we're looking at this, a, the universal principle of a righteous life. Now, by the way, I told you before, as we studied this Sermon on the Mount, and you have to look at everything, you have to look at everything very closely. And then it says, therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. There's a little word there, I don't want you to miss the word, ye. That means, you. But, how about that? Ye, or you, who are those people? I want you to think now, who are the people Jesus talking to? He was talking to his disciples. He was talking to the multitude. He was talking to the people who had been with him from Matthew chapter 5. And already now he brought them to this level. And he said, whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them. Now this, uh, let's look at that word, ye. So that you'll know who the Lord particularly or centered the message on. Matthew chapter 5 verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. Those are the people he was talking to. They have been changed. When you are born, you are not born with the salt in nature. You are born with the rust, that is the nature of rust and disobedience. Children of rust, children of disobedience. These are people who have been born again, they are converted. And the conversion made them sweet, not bitter. Sweet. Not having hatred, sweet, not having any corruption, the corruption of the world. Ye are the salt of the earth. Those are the people Jesus was speaking to. Now you are born again. Now you are no more bitter. Now you are sweet. Ye are the salt of the earth. I'm looking at verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. These are people who have been taken away from darkness and they have come into the light, the light of the gospel, the light of Christ. Because Christ said, I am the light of the world. And now he turned to his own disciples. You know, he couldn't be talking to the Pharisees and saying, you Pharisees, you are the light of the world. No, he couldn't tell them that. Sadducees, you are the light of the world. You know, he couldn't have said that. Of believers, sinners, he told them, you are, you are the children, the children of your father, the devil. But the people who are born again, the people who are children of God, and the beauty of the Beatitudes have been manifested and demonstrated in their lives. And he said, ye are the light of the world. Let your light so shine. How will my light so shine? Whatever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. That's how your light will shine. Those are the people I was talking to. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5 verse 45. Ye. That ye may be the children of your father. That's right. Those are the people I was talking to. Those were the people he was emphasizing to them. Now nobody is going to know that you are born again just by looking at you. If you stay quiet and inactive and passive, how will they know that you are the children of your father which is in heaven? Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. That's how they will know that you are now the children of your father. These are the ye, the you he was talking to. And if you're going to be able to practice Matthew chapter 7 verse 12, you have to come into that group. 
You have to come into that, into that society, into that assembly, congregation of converted people, the ye. That was a ye word that men should do unto you. Do ye even so to them, ye, in verse 46, chapter 5. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. I was talking to people who are different from the publicans. They have been converted. They are told the Lord be merciful unto me, O Lord, a sinner. And the Lord have been merciful to them. Their sins were forgiven. Their lives were turned around. There was a mighty change in their lives. As a result of that conversion from being a publican to being the people of God, now all things ye, now that you are converted, all things that ye were that may should do unto you, do ye even so to them. In verse 47, if ye salute, that's the ye. That means you are no more sectional, you are no more tribalistic. That means you are no more nationalistic. That means you are no more a person only for myself and my family. As we learned last week, tribalism is of your life. Nepotism is of your life. Provincialism is of your life. Nationalism is of your life. You are now a citizen of the kingdom of God, a child of the Heavenly Father. You are no more like the publicans, and if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans the same. He wants it to be different from the publicans. And it is those people that have this difference in their lives. Those are the people that can actually apply Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. As you go back home, and you remember this study, all things, not some things, all things, everything, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you. Do ye even so to them. You try to practice it, you cannot do it. It means that you are not part of the ye, the you. You don't have the grace. You don't have the experience. You don't have the new birth. You don't have a change of heart. You are not the salt of the earth. You are not the light of the world. Therefore, the deeds of your father you will do. If you find that Matthew chapter 7 verse 12, it's impossible for you to practice. It just tells you who you are. You cannot do it because you are not part of the people, the ye. Those people have the grace of God in their lives. Those are the people that can do this. Look at Matthew chapter 5 verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect. Those are the people, the ye. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Come to chapter 6. In chapter 6, I'm reading verse 24. No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. The people have made a decision. They have made a choice. Christ is my Lord. Christ is my Savior. And they are submissive, dedicated, committed unto that one master. Those are the people that Jesus said, All things ye would, may should do to you. Everything. In every part of your life. All things ye would, that men should do to you. Do ye even so to them. They are the people who have chosen Christ as Lord and Master. As Lord and Savior. And they own him as the only Lord. Those are the people. You know, sometimes when people just read this and they say, hey, you know, all things he would, that men should not you be evil so to them. How can I do that? How can you accept your born again? By looking at chapter 6 and looking at verse 33. But seek ye first. Those are the ye, those are the people. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. 
Those are the people. We need to clear that up. Otherwise, you know, people just take this and they become religious. And they just say, okay, I know what to do. I'm going to lay by the golden rule. That will not take you to heaven. In fact, you cannot even do it. Except there is this change and this transformation and this turning around in your life. It is that change, transformation, the grace of God in your heart that makes you to be able to come to Matthew chapter 7 verse 12 and say, praise the Lord, I've got what it takes now. I can obey this because I am the ye that Jesus was talking about. Let's come now to Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You'll see that the verse starts with that great word, therefore, therefore, therefore. Anytime you see that word, therefore, it means that we'll be talking from, you know, the verses before, and now we come to this verse, and we say, because of what we said before, therefore, now do this. What does that mean then? This sublime condensation of the moral law, when you thoughtfully consider it, the grandeur, the greatness, the height, the expanse, of this particular summary of the whole of the moral law, beginning with the word, therefore, what it means is, you know, in verse 11 it says, if you've been able not to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your father, who is in heaven, give good gifts unto those his children that ask him? It says, therefore. Now, the golden rule, that means then he's talking about relationship, relationship, the father-child relationship. It's telling us that this is based on relationship. And it is that relationship that makes you to then go into, the, into, this, um, into this principle of a righteous life, into this golden rule. You know that you cannot apply this to the judge and the criminal. Why? Because there's no relationship. The judge is there to judge. The criminal comes, it's at the, you know, it's the cubicle there. And then, are you guilty? I am guilty, judge. Okay, see what you have done. You have murdered somebody. Now you are going to be sentenced to this particular punishment. Oh, is this judge? What a minute. Whatsoever ye would, or oh, says, judge says, wait, wait, wait. That's not applicable. There's no relationship. You're a criminal. I'm here to judge you. So you cannot say, whatsoever ye would. Here comes uh, a student. A student is taking an exam. And she's is cheating. And the indicator said, what is that? Oh, he says, the indicator. I'm just copying something. All right, I'm going to mark it on your paper. And you have, you have failed the paper already. Oh, the student said, indigenator whatsoever. He would tell. Oh, he just says, wait, wait, wait. There's no relationship. I came to indigenate. It doesn't apply. A same partner wants to quit. The same, they have been committing together. And he says, I'm giving my life to Christ. I don't want to be your same partner anymore. No boyfriend, girlfriend anymore. The other fellow said, hey, you'll break my heart if you leave me. And if you break my heart, would you want somebody to do that to you? Whatsoever you would, or the fellow said, the new convert said, wait, wait. It doesn't apply. There's no relationship. We're seeing partners. I want to go to heaven. This one does not apply. You have been going to which doctor or to a herbalist, and then eventually you know that that is idolatry. That's occultism. You don't want to do that anymore. And then you want to quit. And the herbalist called you and he said, This is the job I do. This is the only work I have. 
I will not be able to earn a living. If you leave me, keep on coming to me and let me be making the portions for you. I say, no. Oh, you say, it's a why. I'm a Christian now. And I'm going to such a church. In fact, it teaches us the Bible. Oh, the Abali, he say, remembers just one verse of scripture. And he says, uh, you want to take my food away from me. You are the only one I depend upon to be giving me money for my herbal sin. And don't you know in your Bible it says whatsoever ye would. Do you want anybody to do this to you and disappoint you? Hey, herbal it doesn't apply. There's no relationship. You know, many people, they just coach this verse of scripture. And it does say, whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, you are walking in a place. And then in that place, somebody stole from the office. And you discovered it. And you say, I'm not going to cover this one up. Ah, please, please don't, don't expose me. Cover me up. No, I will not cover you up. You are a thief. And then the federal remembers one verse of scripture. And he says, ah, come on here. You say you want to be a Christian, isn't it? Whatsoever you would, hey, it doesn't apply. Relationship. This one is a thief. And he wants you to cover him up. And he's trying to coach this. You cannot do that. Because you see, when you open the Bible and you read, you must be able to know that this is where it applies and this is where it doesn't apply. This one applies to relationship, father-child relationship, and then a believer to a real believer relationship. That's what the Lord is talking about. Therefore, now, all things whatsoever he would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them. Then look at the concluding phrase. But this is the law and the purpose. That's right. Anything that contradicts the revelation of the law and the prophets, anything that contradicts the interpretation of the law and the prophets, you cannot apply this golden rule. Because the reason the golden rule is given is just to say, this is the summary. This is the meaning. This is the application. This is the implication of the law and the prophets. And so you need to understand then when anybody comes to you and he says, you know, all things whatsoever, they just quote each, they don't understand it. Now we come to uh, the three points we're looking at today. Number one, the standard of a godly or selfish life. The standard of a godly or selfish life. Number two, the summary of God's unchanging law. This one will never change. This one will never change. Animal sacrifices, that one has changed. And then burning incense, that one has changed. Going to the priest and taking an animal and confessing your sin before the priest and laying hands on the animal, that law, as, that's a ceremonial law, that one has changed. All those Old Testament laws that relate to animal sacrifice and uh, meat offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering, all those, they have changed. But this one will never change. All things whatsoever he would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For these are the law and the prophets. These are the summary of God's unchanging law. Number three, the summit. That means the very high, the summit of gracious, undeniable love. The summit of gracious, or deniable love. Let's come to number one. The standard for a godly or selfish life. That word standard. Standard. There's no standard today in many places. You cannot get to some churches today and say, where is the standard? The standard you lift up like this. And all the newcomers will be looking up to that standard. 
and all the believers will be looking up to that standard and all the worshippers will be looking up to that standard the standard is broken down in many places today in the families no standard in the place of work no standard but the lord is giving us a standard this is the standard of a godly or selfish life look at this world standard isaiah chapter 62 isaiah chapter 62 i'm reading from verse 10 go through go through the gates prepare ye the way of the people cast up cast up the highway gather out the stones lift up a standard for the people lift up a standard for the people and actually that's what jesus christ has been doing in this uh, sermon on the mount before he came only the pharisees and the sadducees put themselves in moses seat they were religious they were not righteous and for all those many years cross darkness in the land but jesus came and he said this is the standard blessed are they that are born in spirit yeah they will have the kingdom of god blessed are they that mourn they shall be comforted blessed are those who thirst and hunger after righteousness they shall be filled and blessed are those who are meek they shall inherit the earth blessed are the pure in heart they shall see god he lifted up a standard before he came there was no standard now he gives us the summary of that standard now and he gives us this standard in Matthew chapter 7 and he's you know, telling us in verse 12 therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you do ye also to them for this is the law and the prophets what is standard only the Lord in his supreme supernatural wisdom could summarize the commandments of God in one single simple sentence in all situations and circumstances of normal relationship notice that of normal relationship normal are there relationships that are not normal yes there are a man committing sin living in sin or somewhere or another why that's a kind of relationship, but that's not normal. A person that is initiated into a cult, and the cult members are saying, cooperate, cooperate, this is how to do it. That's a relationship, that's not normal. But you see, as you apply this, this is for normal relationship. Relationship between parents and children. Relationship between husbands and wives. Relationship between neighbors and friends. Relationship between employers and employees. Relationship between buyers and sellers. Relationship between professionals and their clients. The relationship between the teachers and the learners. That between the, the leaders and the followers. The citizens and the strangers the lenders and the borrowers, the landlords and their tenants, the rich and the poor, the privileged and the less privileged people, whatsoever ye would that others should do to you, do ye even so to them. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24. Here in verse 29, Proverbs chapter 24 verse 29 say not i will do to him as he has done to me you see that i will do to him as he has done to me no i must do to him as he should have done to me he didn't do right he didn't live right he sinned against me he oppressed me, he insulted me, he abused me, he cheated me. I will not do to him as he has done. He doesn't show grace. 
he has not shown righteousness. But all things he would that men should do what they should have done, which they didn't do. That's what you do to them. So it says, Say not, I will do to him as he has done to me. I will render to the man according to his words. That's called retaliation. He says, You can't do that. He says, You will do to him as he should have done. Let's see an illustration of that in Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50, I'm reading from verse 18. You remember the story of Joseph? That young man suffered like no man before his time. And the suffering was so great. And the suffering was so deep. It was a deep cut in his soul. And it gave him emotional trauma. And he gave that teenager of 17 years of age a load to carry, too heavy for his age. In hatred of his brothers, the cruelty of his brothers, the inhumanity of his brothers, the injustice of his brothers, the murderous plan strategy that they carried out against him. It was a heavy blow upon his life. Now what would he do? Eventually they met again. And the table now turned. Originally they were higher because they were older. Because they were more in number. Because there was nobody to check their cruelty. They were higher and greater than, they were stronger than Joseph. But now the table had turned. And Joseph was higher. Higher in authority, higher in power, higher in all the in riches, everything. If you mention the saints, they were all dead, they were gone. Now he was on a higher plane. What would he do now? Remember now what we're looking at. This universal principle of a righteous life. All things whatsoever. Joseph, ye would that they should have done, they should, which they didn't do. Do ye even so unto them. Genesis chapter 50, verse 18. Genesis 50, verse 18. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. Fear not that alone because you know what he did here comes the dreamer is killing then when he grabbed that little boy he removed his coat of many colors he spoke off they put him inside the pitch that will bring fear into his heart but now he said no i'm not going to give you 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 try to give me fear you know fear is not good and i was in that pitch I shivered and trembled. And when I heard what Judah was saying, selling to the Ishmaelites, I said, I'll never see my father again. I tremble with fear. You gave me fear, but I'll not give you fear. I will not do to you like you've done to me. I will do to you like you should have done. That's grace. Without salvation, you can't do it. You say, this is my chance. I'll claim, I'll cut the pound of flesh. I'll get it back. Now I'm in the right position, the right place. I'll show them. If you don't have grace, that's what you'll do. That's what you'll say. But Joseph said, fear not. For am I now, am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good, to bring it to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Verse 21, Now therefore, fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. 
You see, that's, and that's the response of grace, righteousness. That is the response of a saved soul, righteousness. What's the response of an unsaved soul, a sinner, retaliation? What's the response of a saved soul? Righteousness, love, comfort, compassion, mercy, fear not. And then we come to Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5, this is saying it another way, but still saying the same thing. Galatians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 13 and verse 14. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love, serve one another. Ye have been called to liberty. Yeah, that, that's a word that many people love, but they don't understand the word liberty. Liberty. They don't understand. They, they think it's liberty to punch you. The liberty to annoy you, the liberty to oppress you, the liberty to destroy you, the liberty to get rid of you. No, we're just coming from Genesis chapter 15. Liberty. Think about Joseph. That's liberty. He was taken. He was not at that time having liberty. He was put in a pit. He didn't have liberty. He was sold into Potiphar's house, a slave, didn't have liberty. He was sent from Potiphar's house to the prison, didn't have liberty. And now the dream of Pharaoh came. He interpreted the dream and he was released from the prison, that's liberty. And now he was put on the throne in Egypt, that's liberty. Whatever he wanted now, he could do. He had liberty, freedom. And then the brothers came. And he had the freedom and the liberty to do whatever he would do to them. Liberty. But he did not use his liberty, his freedom to oppress his brothers. He used his liberty to serve them in love. That's what the Bible is saying. Now you are at liberty. Nobody is binding you. Nobody is caging you. Nobody imprisons you. Now you are at liberty. Don't use that liberty as an occasion to make other people suffer. Your position, the authority you have, the privilege you have, the strength you have. The power you have, the riches you have, wealth and riches, they make somebody feel that he has some liberty, liberty to do this and liberty to do that. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, say, born again, liberty in Christ. Only use not that liberty if an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, that's another way of saying whatsoever you want them to do to you. Be in their shoes. Put yourself in their situation. What would you want? How would you want others to relate to you, react to you? Do the same. That's what he's telling us there. This precept is of great value. One may forget the details of many commandments of God. You may not be able to remember. Thou shalt not kill. Only remember whatsoever you would. When should do to you? Do evil so to them. You don't want anybody to kill you? Give me an answer. No, then you don't want to kill other people. Honor your father and your mother. That your days may be long on the earth. You may forget that. But just remember, all things whatsoever you want other people to do to you. If you are the father and you are children, will you want this person, your child now, to disrespect you? The answer is no. Okay, don't disrespect your father or your mother. Thou shalt not steal. Maybe you forget that. 
But if you put your property down, would you want anybody to steal what you have? No. Then don't steal what belongs to other people. What all thing whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them. And thou shalt bear no false witness. Do you want anybody to lie against you? And just make a heavy big load of false accusation and put it on your head for you to suffer. No, you don't want anybody to do that to you. Okay, whatsoever you don't want anybody to do to you, don't do to other people. You see, it is this one that summarizes everything that says all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. And then it says, Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's property, anything belonging to your neighbor. Thou shalt not covet. Maybe you forget that, but all you need to remember is whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye evil so to them. Do you want anybody to be eyeing, to be envying you and looking at your property, being covetous, so that you are not feeling safe, you are feeling insecure, because what you have, somebody is coveting. No, you don't want anybody to do that to you. Therefore, don't covet what belongs to others. That's why it says, all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You see this golden rule, this Matthew chapter 7 verse 12, is calling us to a gracious godly life. It's drawing us away from the life of selfishness, self-centeredness, and it's drawing us to a life of Christ-likeness. It teaches us not to act from a selfish motive, from an unjust motive, but to put ourselves in the place of other, of other people and ask what we would expect them to do towards us and then we make that a stepping stone. We make that a kind of instruction, illustration as what, as to what they should do to us. This will make us impartial, kind, considerate, just, gentle and tender. This standard for human behavior, if applied fairly and faithfully, would banish cruelty. If you're living by this principle, what Jesus taught, you cannot be cruel. It will take away unkindness. It will take away sex. It will be very thoughtful. It will take away adultery. By the way, you, do you know something? Uh, the men who commit adultery with other, with other people's wives, that the people that are very, very jealous over their own wives, and if they see their wives talking to a man, innocent talk, innocent relationship, they begin to say, what are you saying? What are you discussing? Why are you talking to him? Why are you talking to her? These people that commit adultery with other women, they are the people that are the most jealous and the most sensitive. Because they are not considering whatsoever ye would, but you don't want people to do to your wife. You don't want to do that to other people's wives too. If you apply this, you'll be free from adultery. And free from murder. You'll be free from abortion. Ask any of these ladies that just live careless, selfish lives of lust of the flesh. And then they become pregnant and they are running into a clinic. They want to commit abortion. Stop them and say, hey, come on here. What are you trying to do? You know this uh, pregnancy? I don't want it. What are you doing now? What do you mean? I'm going to school. What class are you now? This is the class I am. What do you expect to do in life? I want to be this, I want to be this. Only one question I have for you. If your mommy had aborted you before you were born, where would you be now? God forbid, God forbid, my mother will never do that to me. Why are you trying to do that to the baby you are carrying? 
If you apply this in your life, you will not commit a portion. A portion will be a sin forgotten. And if you apply this, there will be no treachery. Like the one of Absalom. No deception. There will be no envy. There will be no covetousness. There will be no sinfulness in general. This precept will prevent unrighteousness among men. If everybody will practice this, the church will be a glorious church. And after this study, before you do anything, you'll wait and think, hey, wait a minute. What I want to say about brother so and so now, would I want somebody to say that about me? No. I kept quiet. Anytime you want to react to a particular sister, sister, how about this? And then you want to react, just wait. How would I want other people to react to me? I want them to be nice to me, gentle with me. I want them to recognize I'm a human being, I have feeling, I have emotion. I don't want anybody to just to do anything, to just do whatever without thinking of my personality. Okay, then I'm thinking of that. If that's what I want, then that influences what I do to other people. Our leaders, a coordinator, a group coordinator, he calls me. And then, you know, you're the way we used to behave. Then I sit before I react to my coordinator, to my group coordinator, I must think now. Who knows, tomorrow I may become a group coordinator. I'm praying for you. You will. Give me a good amen. When you become a leader, an overseer, you become a pastor, you become a group coordinator, you become an evangelist, how will you want the people who are under your leadership, how would you want them to relate to you, to behave to you? I'm thinking now, I'm not going to keep on doing that bad thing to the coordinator, group coordinator, or my pastor, or my overseer anymore. You see, if we apply this in our lives, in every little detail, you know what's going to happen? We're going to have a glorious church, and this year, we're having a glorious church. If everybody around us will practice this, the world will be a better place in which to live, in which to work, in which to prepare for eternity. I come to point number two. The summary of God's unchanging law. The summary of God's unchanging law. We're looking at Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. Matthew chapter 7. And we're looking at each in verse 12. 7, 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. And now Jesus said, For this is the law and the prophets. is saying, This is the summary of the law of God, which is unchanging. See how Romans chapter 13 puts that. Romans chapter 13. And I'm reading from verse 8. Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Oh, no man, anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. Oh, no man, anything. My brothers and sisters, can you look up at me here? Do you know there are people that owe another person money? And they are working, they are getting salary. Let's say, for example, they owe 74,000 naira. And then the person they owe the money is waiting. Ah, this, this brother, how is it like this? I see he will not pay me my money. He doesn't even have the courtesy, the respect, the honor to say, brother, I remember you. I remember what I owe you. So, yes, I remember. I remember. Please uh, be patient with me. I am going to pay. He doesn't, he doesn't even do that. He's building a house. He's buying a car. He has got promotion in his place of work. He's getting higher salary now. 
then when he owes the money, but he's not talking about paying back at all. Now, if somebody owed you money, how would you want them to respond to you? You will want them before they buy their new car. You want to buy a car too. Before they buy their new car, you want them to remember he's owing me some amount of money. But you know there are some people who say they are Christians. That's what they say. They say they are Christians. Whether heaven calls them Christian or not, that's another story. Whether the Bible approves of them as Christian, that's another story. Whether the people they owe money, whether they think of them as Christians, that's another story. But they call themselves Christians. And the money they owe, they never, never think about the money. But if you're going to apply this universal principle of a righteous life, you must understand that you will pay your debt. You'll not just be another year to roll over another year. You're rolling over another year and the debt is still there. And in fact, you're not even thinking of paying interest. That's a terrible thing. If you're a Christian, you have conscience. If you have conscience, you'll think about the person you owe. Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Oh no man, anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Or if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying. Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the summary of everything. That's the conclusion of everything. That's the summit, the substance of everything. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law that will wake us up. And we're going to go right in Jesus' name. We're looking at this right, Galatians chapter 5 again. We we're, were ready before. We're going to read it again. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. All the law is fulfilled in one word. Brothers and sisters, look up here. You might know, know some people. They try to memorize a lot of Bible passages. And then they say, you know, there are 31 days in the month. And there are 31 chapters in the Proverbs. I'm going to try and memorize one chapter every day. And then anytime they come to see you, they want to demonstrate how much Bible they know. And then they start, they said, what's today's date? Oh, you tell them today is the 4th of February. Okay, Proverbs chapter 4. And they rattle it on. And then I'm trying to tell them, my brother, you don't need to memorize all that. What you need to do is get one verse. The whole thing is comprehended in this one word. Even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. How many people know too many passages of the Bible and this one verse they do not know? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's in relating with your wife. You, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Brother, this woman is crying. The way you are dealing with her. Thou shalt love your wife as thyself. Master, this servant is crying. The way you are dealing with him. Thou shalt love thy servant as thyself. Law enforcement officer. This man you delay by the side of the road. is going for an interview. And you are folding his papers, and he cannot move. Thou shalt love him as thyself. Release him, let him go for his interview. Teacher, 
all these things that we are doing before we can allow children to even be able to take exam they have to pay this amount of money and this amount of money and in teaching them before we even give out what their parents have their paid school fees already their paid tuition fees already before we can even hand out all these uh, you know papers they have to pay a particular amount of money and as a treasurer in the class that is collecting the money and marking the register of paying money thou shalt love the student as thyself when you went to school teacher lecturer professor did your professors do that to you where would you be if they did that to you in the past just one word the whole law is comprehended in this one word thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself and you know let's come back to the church here you know this thing we call and uh, knowing the will of god and and all that and some of our young people make that almost to torture people, torment people. Sister, can I talk to you? What do you want to say? And then the insults. As if the brother is not a human being. And the way the lady will behave. Hey, what's the matter? Even if you are the most beautiful, the most spiritual, and the most talented in the land, why don't you behave to this? What does he want to say? Let him talk. If you are going to say no, you can say no in a dignified way, in a comforting way, in a reassuring way. You can say no in such a way that the brother will not feel as if he is less than a human being. And, and, and sometimes it may be a sister that she no wants to talk to the brother. What else to talk about? You had a dream? You saw me? Ah, if it's me, don't think about that. You can say that in a better way. That the sister be able to go to sleep tonight. So that she should not be so bothered and say, and say, why did I even talk to that brother at all? Now look at me, he has cut me down to pieces. I'm not like a human being anymore. Whatsoever you would, that men should do unto you, do you even so to them? The disrespect, the dishonor, the insult, the oppression, and the way we deal with one another as if you know people don't have any feeling and then when you are unhappy and when you feel oppressed and when you feel intimidated and when you feel frightened and fearful then they are happy they said yes i brought him under what he look at all of us who are here what if everybody here will try to bring you under you will not amount to handful if everybody is trying to squeeze you whatever you want to do you want others to do to you do you even so to them that's what the lord is teaching us this is the evidence of salvation it's the evidence of the grace of god in our hearts in our lives it is the evidence we have met the lord jesus christ our lives, our behavior, our character, our conduct, the way we the way we carry ourselves with other people. That's what it says. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so unto them. For this is the law and the prophets. I want you clean at um, uh, First Corinthians chapter thirteen. First Corinthians chapter thirteen. I'm reading from verse one. Do I speak the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity? I am become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Oh, what's charity? How do I find charity? How do I see charity on you? It's not reaching our forehead. When I see you, that what you are considerate, you are tolerant, you are tender, you are loving, that's charity. You, you, you consider other people. That person spoke to you like that. Why didn't you reply him? No, I don't want to hurt, I, I don't want to hurt his feeling. I don't want to offend him. But he offended you. Yes, I know. I don't want to pay him back. That's charity. 
But it says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, if I speak many languages, and if you sing in many languages, and if you pray in many languages, and yet you don't have this one we're talking about, there's no salvation there. That's true. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and I'm not charity, I am nothing. Can you think about what people can do with faith, moving mountains, prophesying, understanding the mysteries of the kingdom? They can gather a large crowd. They can become crowd pullers. But if you don't have this love we're talking about, the higher you go, the more snobbish you come. You become. The higher you go, the more proud you become. The higher you go, the more incorrigible you become. And there's no glory there. That kind of greatness is going to land somebody in hell. But whatever you have, there is charity, there is love. You, you are considerate of other people. What things soever ye would that men should do to you, you do that even so to them. Verse 3. And though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt, and have not charity, it profited me nothing. Uh, let, let's, let's look at these verses again. You know, sometimes. Uh, um, and it's good for us who are studying the Bible. And um, I've been studying the Bible now more than I ever did. I've always studied the Bible, but I study it more now. You know, sometimes you're looking for somebody who can be a pastor, somebody who can be an overseer, somebody who can be a worker. What are you looking for? See, the man has the baptism in the Holy Ghost. The man is speaking in the tongues of men and of angels. See, the man understands eschatology. The man can teach effectively from the rapture to the great revelation and then to the time of the Antichrist and to the second coming and to the great white throne judgment and to the marriage supper of the Lamb and to the new Jerusalem and then to the eternal state of the unbelievers and the sinners. The man has a lot of knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom. But... His wife is suffering at home. The love, the charity, the tenderness is not there. Are we going to just place the fellow there? He can speak. He can talk. He can teach. He can string some verses of the Bible together. He is energetic. He has a lot of faith. He has a healing ministry. What's that? Without charity. Without love. In verse 4, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envies not, charity bonteth not itself, is not popped up. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things. Opeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. That's what, that's what we need. We're going to have it. Colossians chapter 3 verse 12. In Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. We're reading from verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God. Holy and beloved, powers of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, evidence of salvation, evidence of salvation. Salvation does not stand in isolation. Testimony cannot hang in the air. There must be a support. See. If you throw something up, 
If he doesn't have any support, it will come down. It will fall flat. If you raise up a testimony and throw up a testimony before the congregation, if he doesn't have any support, it will fall to the ground. And the thing that supports and sustains your testimony of salvation, here we are, barrels of mercies. We know that some believers don't have mercy. They don't have any barrels of mercies. You see those landlords who are not born again, you can tell. Kindness. You see all those people, church goers, church comers, who throw up testimonies. I'm saved. But the testimony doesn't have any support. No kindness. No mercy. No consideration for how other people feel. They torment their wives and children, their husbands and children at home. Neighbors do not enjoy living with them. The testimonies they throw up, not having any support, will fall down. Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind. And you know, you talk to some people you know, who throw up all these testimonies of being saved and saved and saved. Every time we come to our Thursday revival evangelism service, if you know they came up last Thursday, they're coming this Thursday, they're coming every time. They always have something to talk about. I'm saved, I'm saved. Praise the Lord, and I'm prayerful. And I did this and I did this. The other time I spoke to somebody and the fellow was not yielding. And then because of this and you know, all these testimonies, where is the support for the testimony? The life you live, the actions of your hands, the interaction that you have with people, the humbleness of mind, the meekness, the long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these, put on charity. Above all these, what does that mean? Wear it like you wear your clothes. Wear it like you put on your dressing. And let people see your charity, your love, your kindness, your mercy, your gentleness, your tenderness, as to see your dress. Above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of affection. James chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 8. James chapter 2, verse 8. If you fulfill the royal law, that's what we've been talking about. Love one another, love others like yourself. That's the royal law. If you, if you, if you fulfill the royal law, According to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Verse 12, so speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. It's called the royal law. It's called the law of liberty. That is, if you have been set free and you are now at liberty, here is the law for those people whose fetters have been broken, whose chains have been removed, and you are now at liberty. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and of death. Those are the people at liberty, and they follow the law of liberty. James chapter 1 verse 25. James 1 verse 25. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. It's called the law of liberty and it's called the royal law. Now it's called the law of Christ. Galatians chapter 6, 
we're looking at verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens. Don't be a burden to other people. Don't increase the burdens of other people. Don't oppress other people. Greater burdens, greater torture, greater torment, greater difficulties. You know, believers, they are already facing a lot of persecution, a lot of misunderstanding, and a lot of burden they carry, family body, and the body in their places of work. We carry bodies a lot. And when we come to now react and relate and respond to the children of God, don't increase their body. Fulfill the law of Christ. It says, bear ye one another's bodies, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I pray that we'll do that in Jesus' name. We come to point number three now, the summit, at the very height, the peak. The summit of gracious, undeniable love. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're looking at verse 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Do something practical. Something visible something that you can evaluate something that is tangible do you know some people their religion has no deeds they don't do anything oh they say christ has done everything at calvary how about you today no i do nothing are you born again? Yes, I'm born again. On what grounds? On the ground that Christ has done everything. What do you do today? Nothing. Do you evangelize going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? No, I don't have to do that. I do nothing. Do you try to establish the new converts? No, I told you, I do nothing. Do you visit the sick? No, I do nothing. Do you try to establish the believers in the faith? I told you, I do nothing. How do you show you are a Christian? I just believe. No, it's more than just believe. You have to do. Therefore, what things soever you would that men should do. Do that men should do. Wait a minute. What if nobody on earth does anything to you, for you? Somebody to cook your food. Have you finished cooking the food? No, I do nothing. Somebody to clean up your house. Have you cleaned up the house? No, I do nothing. A tailor to sew your clothes. Have you, have you finished sewing my clothes? No, I do nothing. And then the Tadziman to carry you from where you are to where you ought to go. Tadziman, what are you doing? Nothing. I do nothing. What if everybody on earth will just say, Christ has done everything, and because of that I do nothing. You'll be dead in one week. You want other people to do good things to you? They are saved. You are looking for good deeds, good action, and good behavior from them towards you. Therefore, you must do something. You cannot just fold your arms and say, I'm a child of God. Christ has done everything. It is the same Christ that said, therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them, for they said the law and the prophets. John chapter 13. Love does something. Love cannot be passive. Love is active. Love is operative. It does something. Love is creative. Love is productive. It does something. John 
chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye should love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know. Not by your testimony. Those testimonies are great. But by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. Romans chapter 12. We're reading from verse 9. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation, without hypocrisy, without pretense. Make it real. Make it visible. Make it sweet. Make it enjoyable. Let love be without dissimulation. And all that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, faith, third venture, speech, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patience in tribulation. Continue with instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints. Distributing. Look up here. Let's say somebody, for example, stays here and has a lot of things over here. And all our brothers and sisters and my children here, everybody, we need this thing here. And we're all sitting down. And he just comes here. And he pulls his hand, those things are there, I will say, pick them up, distribute, distribute, be a distributor. It is when he now bends down and carries the thing and then begins to give one by one. And then you say, I've got mine, I got it from him, I've got mine, I got it from him, I got mine, I got it from him. He puts joy into your life, be a distributor, that's the law. That's the evidence that you have something. Give it out. That's what we're saying. You want other people to distribute and touch your life and give you something, make you happy, make you fulfilled. Do that to others too. All things whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. For this is the summary and the summit. This is the law and the prophets. You must distribute something good. You give to other people. Give it to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one to one another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of your estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. They compare to no man evil for evil. Why? Oh, because when people pay you evil, you don't enjoy that. Whatsoever you would, that men should do to you. Do ye even so to them. You don't enjoy it when people do something evil, something bad, something terrible, something that gives heartache, something that disturbs your mind, your emotion, your life, something that scatters your family. You don't enjoy that, then don't do that to other people. It says recompense to no man, evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as it lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. But rather, give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, 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 if then enemy hunger, feed him. Is your enemy. He will not feed you. Do what he should have done that he didn't do. If he thirst, give him drink. 
He wouldn't do that except he wants to give you poison. Don't do what you do. Do something different. While they are trying to give death and to spread death, you give life. Something that will make them keep on living a happy life. And then it says, For in so, in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with of evil, but overcome evil with good. It tells us in First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. We're looking at verse 22. First Peter chapter 1 verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto a French love of the brethren, see that she love one another with what kind of heart? A pure heart, a pure heart, a pure heart sluggishly. Is that so? You know, you know the way some people manifest in the Christian fold, the way they manifest their love today. I have purity, I have sanctification, my heart is pure. I've had that before. Show it. And then as I want to show that pure heart and they love one another with a pure heart sluggishly. In a lukewarm way, there's no excitement in their love. There's no enthusiasm in their love. And there's nothing that makes you to feel, I want to see him again. I want to see her again because she loves fervently. But it says you have a pure heart. With that pure heart, you show the love, you demonstrate the love. We're not talking about lust. We're not talking about fleshly demonstration. But some people will know if you really love them excitedly, enthusiastically, fervently. And they're so happy to see you. And you are so happy to see them. That's how the church should be. See that she love one another with a pure heart fervently. Here the Lord has taught us today. And the Lord has given us the very evidence of his salvation and redemption within us. He actually came to preach the message of love, the love of God that offers to save men from their sins. Not to live the message, he has declared his mission. And his mission is to plant this love of God in every earth. Not only the mission of the message, he also performs the miracle of redemption, the miracle of transformation, and the miracle of giving us this change of heart and this change of life. That not the beneficiaries of those of the mission, the recipients of the message, and then those who partake of the miracle power of the Lord. They have this grace that gives the love of God, sheds the love of God abroad in their hearts. In gratitude to God, who has given his only begotten Son to save them, they now want to manifest and exhibit and demonstrate that love to all the people. How do we demonstrate that? Number one, you seek sinners to save. You seek for sinners so you can get them saved. That's how we demonstrate love. If you see those sinners there, and you never tell them anything, there's no love there. You are not obeying the golden rule. You are a sinner. Somebody came to you and spoke to you and brought you to the way of salvation. As he would that makes you don't you do even so to them. If you were still in sin in darkness, what would you want the people that have the light to do? You want them to come to you and show you the light. Go and show them the light as well. First Corinthians chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 20, from verse 19 to verse 22. First Corinthians chapter chapter 9. It says in verse 19, For though I be free from all men, yet I make myself the servant of all, that I might gain the more. Unto the Jews I became as a Jew, 
that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, and to them that are without the law as without law, not being without law to God, but under the law of Christ, that I might gain them that are, under the, that are without law. To the weed became I as weed, that I might gain the weed. I have made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. If you are following this uh, golden rule as an evidence that you are truly born again, you will want to talk to all the sinners. Number two, you will establish new converts. When converts are one, when you are a new convert, people followed up on you, they ran after you, they established you, they helped you. And if you're going to follow the golden rule, what they did to you, you're going to do. It says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14, that we as God be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slaves of men, and calling craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. If, if you're a real child of God, and then these new people, new believers, new converts, they are, they are brought into the kingdom. If you are going to follow what the Lord is teaching us tonight, as an evidence that you have the grace of God in your heart, in your life, you are going to follow up on them, establish the new converts. Number three, you will recover the backsliders. You are not talking about them. You are going to talk to them. You are not backbite against them. You are going to visit them. Recover them. James chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 19 and verse 20. James chapter 5, verse 19, brethren. If any of you do hear from the truth and want convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death. When somebody backslides, he goes back into spiritual death. And then because if you are a backslider, you will not want people to just gossip about you, talk about you, make jest of you, abandon you. You want people to visit you. All right then, whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. Run after them, recover them, and save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Number four. Encourage your pastors and overseers. And you see this golden rule is telling us, what if you are the pastor? What if you are the overseer? What if you are the leader? How would you want the people you are preaching to every week and you are laboring on, you are fasting for them, you are praying for them, you are, calling, you are preparing them to get to heaven? How would you want them to relate to you? Would you want them to you like the children of Israel did to Moses and make Moses not to get to the promised land. And Moses fasted 40 days. Then he came back to them. He fasted 40 days again. And he did everything that he ought to do so that these people will get to the land of promise. When there was no water to drink, he was the one God used as an instrument to give them water to drink. When there was no food, he gave them food. And these people, they were not considerate. Would you be considerate over your leaders, coordinators, group coordinators, and, and, and help them, encourage them, make them happy? in the work they are doing. In 2 uh, Corinthians, I'm reading from chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And you don't backbite, you don't talk against their wives, against their children, leave their children alone. They'll train their children themselves without our kind of, you know, talk, talk, talk against the children of the leaders. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 5. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Those are leaders, troubled on every side. Without our fighting, some within fears. 
Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Not only by his coming, not only by his coming, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. You know, Titus went to those Corinthians, and those Corinthians, this one of our leaders, this one of our leaders, and he comforted him. And then he came back to Paul and said, Paul, you know, it's unbelievable, unbelievable. I got to Corinth and tell me, I was tired before I got there. When I got there, those people are strengthened now. That information strengthened Paul there, also strengthened all the other leaders. Will you then strengthen the leaders and comfort your leaders and be an encouragement to your leaders, your local leaders, your uh, regional leaders, your state leaders, your national leaders. In First Thessalonians, I'm reading from chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. I will beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and I offer you in the Lord and admonish you to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Will you become a leader tomorrow? Because you are going to become leaders. I said you are going to become leaders. But that's what we'll be expecting from the, the church. The church. You see, I was a sooner leader, I was uh, a house fellowship leader, I was a coordinator, and now I'm a pastor in a local church. And then you'll be expecting, you'll be expecting for them to honor you. Little, little things are coming. You know, they say, oh, pastor, you can pass. Or they, they, you want to, during the retreat, you want to get the food. They say, no, pastor, we'll bring your food to little, little things. That's what you expect when eventually you become a leader yourself. Do it to the present leaders, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you. Do ye even so to them. Number five, support and strengthen the weak. Support the weak. Don't crush them. If you are weak, what will you want others to do to you? All things whatsoever. Ye would that men should do to you. If you were weak, do ye even so to them. First Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, one then that are really comfort the feeble minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. But ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Number six, visit those who are sick. If you were sick, for a whole week, you couldn't even cook for yourself. And you couldn't even go and take water and bath. You are just there. Wouldn't you be expecting people to visit you? And then you are counting, one day is gone, nobody has visited me. Two days gone already, three days gone already. And it appears that the sickness is getting worse. Actually, it's the loneliness for the sickness that makes the sickness more serious. You want other people to visit you if you were sick. All things whatsoever you will that men should do unto you. Everything. If you were sick, if you were weak, if you were helpless, and you couldn't do anything for yourself. In that situation of sickness, in that situation of weakness, you'll want the brothers and the sisters, where is brother so-and-so? Where is sister so-and-so? We have not seen her at the choir practice. We have not seen her at the Sunday worship. She wasn't there in the Sunday meeting. She didn't come for the leaders meeting. You want them to check up on you. Check up on other people. That's what the Lord is teaching us in James chapter 1 verse 27. James chapter 1 verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, in their suffering, in their sorrow, in their sickness, and to keep himself 
or scottage from the world. Number seven, comfort the sorrowful. Don't make anybody sorrowful. If anybody is sorrowful, comfort them, comfort them, comfort them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Yeah, that's what the Lord wants us to do. Come back now to Matthew chapter 7. This is a practical study. It's not something to just be in our head, it must be in our heart. It must also come into our hands, it must move our feet, it must set us in motion to go and do as we have learned. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Can we do it? Are we going to do it? By the grace of God, we are going to do it. Therefore, all things, all things, at all times, in all places, to all people, in all situations, in all circumstances, all the days of our lives, all things whatsoever, ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Let's rise up and commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer. Nobody going out until we pray. And nobody praying to disturb other people. And nobody actually any way to distract the attention of anybody. Close your eyes and now we're going to pray. We've learned quite a lot. A standard. A standard. A standard of a godly or selfish life. The evidence of salvation. The evidence that we know the Lord. The evidence that we visited Calvary and the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross of Calvary has cleansed our hearts, has turned our lives around, has transformed us, has translated us out of the kingdom of darkness unto the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his dear son. The evidence of righteousness. The evidence of real salvation and Christ likeness. Think about it. Your relationship, father child relationship. Think about it. Husband wife relationship. Think about it. Employee employer relationship. Think about it. Brothers and sisters in the church. Think about it. Landlord and tenant relationship. Think about it. Employee and employer, how do you do your work? All things, whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. And show an evidence, show an evidence that you have real salvation. Let your testimony, let your testimony and support the support of a righteous life, the, the, the support of a principled life. The support of a practical Christian living. Tell the Lord that the Lord will help you to now remember, remember, remember the word every time. Lord, I've had your word. Help me, Lord, to remember all things. You would. All things whatsoever. Anytime, everywhere, at all, in the church, in the community, in the place of work, in the school, in the college, at the university, in the extended family, in the village, in your home, at 
the conference here, all things you watch that men should do to you, be considerate. Let the grace of God show in your life and flow through your life. Apply that to so many. You have the knowledge. Other people are perishing. Show them the way of life. You have the water of life. Other people are thirsty. Show them the way of life. You have the bread of life. Other people are hungry. Give them the bread of life. You know the way. The way that leads to heaven. Other people showed you that way. Show them the way. Recover the backsliders. Don't talk about them. Don't backbite about them. Don't disrespect them. Don't insult them. Don't abuse them. Go to them. Go to them. Go to them. Recover them from backsliding. Tell them they can still get up. Tell them they can still be forgiven. Tell them there is still mercy and grace. Tell them the love of God is still waiting for them. Tell them they don't have to perish. Tell them the Heavenly Father's heart is still yearning after them. Run after those backsliders, recover them. Bring them back home. Help the new converts. Help the new converts to stand. Establish them. Comfort them in the truth. Everybody praying, everybody praying, not looking around. Commit yourself, consecrate yourself. You'll do something. You'll do something. You'll do something. Do something for the kingdom. This is your chance. All things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For they said the law and the prophets. This new converts, do your best. Help them, teach them, instruct them, counsel them, pray with them, strengthen them, answer their questions. You need to do restitution. Guide them, gently guide them, wisely guide them. So that there are no more children to stand for. By the cunning craftiness of men that lie in wait to deceive. And then respect our pastors. If you are a pastor, you want the respect of your member, members of your church. Respect those pastors. Even pastors outside deep alive. Don't insult them. You may not agree with everything they say. They may not know everything you know. That's not that's not your business. But don't don't insult any pastor outside. Don't disrespect any pastor outside deep alive. You want other pastors outside to respect us too. You don't want anybody outside there to speak in derogatory manner against our pastors here in deeper life. Don't do that to them too. Respect them. Respect them. Don't insult anyone, publicly or privately. And then our own pastors here, our own leaders, our own overseers here, by helping us, teaching us, praying for us, lifting us up, preparing us for heaven, getting us ready for the rapture, love them, honor them, respect them, encourage them. Be an encouragement. Support and strengthen the weak. If you are weak, you want others to support you, to strengthen you. Do the same to them. And visit those who are sick. Visit those who are sick. 
I know you see them empty handed, they need food, take food to them. Whatever they need, take that to them. Give you some help, render some help. Comfort the sorrowful. Dry up their tears. Obey the word of God and give the evidence of grace and salvation in your heart in your life. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them. But this is the law and the prophets.